Jerry Bruckheimer here on The Rich Eisen Show. Good to see you, Jerry. Great to be here, Rich. Thanks for having me. And I'm not just saying that about Top Gun Maverick um, because you're sitting here, but uh, my wife and I went and saw it, and we we were walking on air after that movie because it was exactly what we had hoped it would be. That it really was. I mean, just from the very beginning, from the Jerry Bruckheimer lightning strike before anything starts to hearing um you know Kenny Loggins danger zone danger zone and then the uh, the heat coming off the tarmac and then Tom Cruise on a motorcycle like you you hit pretty much every button I wanted to hit in the first 10 seconds of that movie what did you what did you make of of Top Gun Maverick Jerry it was such a joy to make it and to be back with Tom Cruise I'm really fortunate that I made three movies with him because he's such a force in a very good way mm-hmm. He demands excellence. He's an amazing actor. He's a better producer than I'll ever be. And he cares about what he does. He's like the Tom Brady mm-hmm. of, of our business because he really, really works so hard. He's there early in the morning. He's there late at night. He works on weekends. He takes care of himself like an athlete. He watches his diet. He works out. He gets to bed early. He's, he's one of those people that really you want to admire because of his dedication to his craft. And he loves making movies. And when you look at Top Gun, his performance is so subtle and so good. You know, sometimes you don't see it because he's so natural and so real. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not in a drunk scene where, you know, he's saying an actor is so great because he plays a drunk so well. Mm-hmm. Tom just does everything perfect. And it comes off as natural and that's exactly what you want i thought you you went with the brady analogy because tom cruise never ages too <laughs> they're, they're very similar <laughs> it could be in something like that yeah. as well so uh back in the day for the original top gun he needed convincing though to do the role correct well Is that there's true? two stories there's tom's story and then there's my story okay kind of conflict it's been 35 years so 36 years <laughs> sure what happened is we gave him a script we worked on the script with him and we couldn't get him to commit to the movie So I called the Navy and I said, we have this actor, we'd like to get him in this movie. And they arranged for me to have him fly with the Blue Angels. So we went down to, he went down to Miramar, California. Mm -hmm. He drove down there in his motorcycle, of course. (laughs) And he's got this long flowing hair. He just finished another picture when he's shoulder length there. And this is back in the 85, it was much different than it is today. Sure. And so the pilots look at him and say, Oh, here comes a hippie. Let's give him a ride. So they spun him and flipped him and thought that he'd, you know, come out of there dizzy and out of his mind. He got out and he said, That was fantastic. He ran to a payphone because there were no cell phones. <laughs> and he called me up and said, I'm in, I'm in, I'm doing the movie. But now his story is he was always doing the movie. <laughs> he, was just, he was just torturing us. But I, I don't know what the truth is. So your plan kind of worked in a way that you got him to do it. See, he's the, he literally is that much of a daredevil where he, you you just want to get the adrenaline rush going, and he was in. I don't know if it. you've seen the cuts from or the clips from Mission Impossible. But oh my God! Yeah, he's stunts. out on he's out on a wing. I mean, he, I mean, he's crazy. It's nuts what he does. Do you ever tell him that you you shouldn't do it or you can't do it, or you know, have you ever had that is, conversation with him? What, what he does is, it's it's like a step process with mm-hmm. him. Every stunt that he does is so well rehearsed. He starts in in a very elementary manner, and then he works himself up to the final stunt. Nothing he does is without care, calculation, and surrounding himself with great people. Mm -hmm. And so putting together Top Gun Maverick, um, what was what did you have a concern? I mean, that you were touching sort of hallowed ground here and that you were basically creating something new when the original had already, I mean, it's it's at a certain status now that you were kind of potentially messing with. Did that concern you at all? Yes, absolutely. And, and it concerned Tom. It's a it's a signature movie for him. It really skyrocketed his career. Right. So when Joe Kaczynski, who's the director of the movie, Mm -hmm. and I flew to Paris, Joe had an idea on how we're going to do the movie, which is exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. And we pitched, he pitched Tom the story, and he had a a lookbook where he had photographs that he put together of what he wanted the movie to look like. And Tom said, 
this is really good. I like it. But here, Joe, you got to promise me one thing. If we do this, it has to be real. We have to get everybody up in the jets. And the first movie, we put the actors up in jets, mm -hmm. and we couldn't use a frame of it. They all threw up. It was a mess. <laughs> I think there's one shot of Tom in the movie, in the, in the real plane. So this time, Tom and Joe designed this program where for three months we had our actors in first a prop plane, then an aerobatic prop, then a jet, mm. then an F-18. So they went through this process of dealing with the G-forces. So when they actually had to act, they could handle the G-forces. But it wasn't quite that easy because what happens is the actors have to rehearse on the ground with the director and with Tom in a makeshift cockpit. Then they have to get in the plane. They have to do their own makeup up there. They have to turn the camera on. They have to figure out where the sun is because they shouldn't say their lines because it has to match to the exterior. Yeah. So it was a lot of work. And we'd send them up there, and they'd be up there for two hours. And they, we couldn't see what they were doing. We could hear them. They come down. Tom and Joe look at the footage. And they said, ah, let's do it again. So they went right back up again. And by the way, when they get down on the ground, they're soaking wet. I mean, they're getting pounded around there with those G-forces. It is so hard and so compromising. And be able to, to work and to act and be as brilliant as these kids are, it's, it's phenomenal. Well, it was just amazing. It really was. I, I honestly felt like I was put back in a time warp back in 1985, and I was back, you know, a young kid again watching this movie. It was just amazing. And a, a, a sign of a good movie... Uh, or great movie is when people are talking about it and word of mouth is going strong and that happened with Top Gun Maverick and then that there's also crazy ass conspiracy theories. You, do, have you heard the one involving your film that, that I, have you vaguely. heard about this one that 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 when Tom Cruise in the very beginning of it, it you know goes up and destroys the no, spoiler alert it's just at the beginning it destroys the plane that he actually dies in it and the rest of it is a is a uh, a dream sequence after he's passed away. It's not true, but it's an interesting <laughs> theory. Fun. That is out there, right, Chris? Is that oh, being yeah. discussed it's right now? It's definitely out there. Just because it's all neatly how, you know, he, he you know, him and Goose, him and Goose's son have a great relationship, and it kind of ties up all the... Well, at the end of the movie, they the have a great movie, relationship. But I'm saying that the, right. the whole lot is, it's just a, you know, fan theory. So that is not true. You can debunk that right now. Yes, but if it sells tickets, we'll, we'll go with there it. There we go, ladies, hey. ladies and gentlemen. Jerry Bruckheimer. Very good. Um, so Beverly Hills Cop, I want to discuss this film with sure. you as well. Um, is it true Sly Stallone was originally cast in That's the role true. of Axel That's Foley? True. That's true. We, we what happened gave there? The, what happened was we went, we developed the script, and we took it to Eddie Murphy. Mm -hmm. uh, that was our first show. We didn't take it to him. We said to Paramount we would like Eddie Murphy to be in the movie. This is after 48 hours, right? right. right after, you'd already... after 48 hours. Okay, right. And Paramount said, well, we think Stallone. And the reason they thought Stallone is they had a pay and pay commit, pay or and play commit, which means they had, he was in another movie, the movie didn't go, and they had to pay him. Yes. And they didn't have a movie for him. So this was going to be the movie. So Sly, being, the great, he's a great writer, by the way. Sure. People don't understand. <laughs> Rocky, I mean, we can go back into the 70s, and too, he, right? he took the script and rewrote it and it added a lot more action. So... We get the script, it's a good script, and we give it to Paramount Production, and they do a budget, and the budget, the movie doubled the cost. Mm -hmm. And so Paramount says, all right, we can't afford to make this. You go tell Sly to cut it back. And I said, he's the biggest star in the world. I'm not going to tell him to cut it back. It's your job. <laughs> so they said, well, what are you going to do? I said, we told you we wanted Eddie Murphy. If you can't afford it with Sly, let's do it with Eddie Murphy. And he said, okay, go get Eddie Murphy. So we fly to, to New Jersey. And we sit with Eddie, and we pitch him the story. Now, you have to understand, Eddie, he is, when you see him on screen, he's vibrant and funny, but when you pitch him a story, he stares at you. And he listens. He's an actor that actually listens. Yes. And so we had no idea if he liked it or not. Fortunately, at the end, he smiled and laughed, and he said, let's go do it. But it, you, you never know if you can get hook an actor. And so we hooked him. Mm -hmm. Now, the conventional wisdom at the time was no African-American actor by himself, had grossed more than $20 million. Mm -hmm. So we had to make sure the budget fit within their, their numbers. Mm -hmm. Unbeknownst to anybody who was in Hollywood at that time, not only did it gross more than $20 million, it was the highest grossing R-rated movie until The Hangover. 
$235 million domestic, which is unbelievable. So it shows you, you have talent, doesn't matter their skin color, doesn't matter anything. If the movie's great, right. you got a great actor, that's what it's all about. How much was it ad-libbed? How much of that stuff got ad-libbed in that film? Uh, he, he had, we think? gave him the parameters yes. of the scene. There were certain plot points he had to hit. And beyond that, he was on his own. So he just went and, and riffed it. And he's, he, guy's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. The banana in the tailpipe, though, that was in, that was in the script. That was in there. Okay. And the buffet <laughs> being wrecked at the Harrow Club, yeah. that was in there as oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could, I could literally do this for another 15 <laughs> hours with you on that front. And so the T-shirt that he wore, the Mumford High, that, that's your high school? That's my high school. Back in uh, Michigan? Back in Detroit. Back in Detroit. Yeah. So... That was there was a lot of personal stuff for you, I imagine, in that film. Yeah, I'm, Just, you know, I'm a Lions fan. I'm a Tigers fan. I'm a suffering Lions fan. Yes, and I guess a suffering Tigers fan. But I love the Red Wings, and they had some good runs. Mm -hmm. But the Lions, I feel so bad for the Lions. Our fans have just been hammered for I don't know how many years. Well, technically now, Jerry Bruckheimer, you can kind of swing to the Seahawks right now, right? I mean, you're you're in the Seattle sports scene as an owner. Well, I have the Rams and the Seahawks. Got so the I'm, Rams I'm in, here. That's I'm true. In pretty good shape. You're Mr. Los Angeles yeah, guy right here, exactly. right now. And I do want to talk about the Seattle Kraken with you for for a bit sure. too. But uh, your favorite sports movie? Forget about the ones that you've done. Which one do you think? I guess Hoosiers. I'm with you. Yeah, Hoosiers is a great movie. That's it, right? Yeah. That is number one for me. Yeah, Hoosiers me is it for me. Yeah. Why is it that it for you? It's emotional. And and going back to Top Gun, people talk about the flying. They mm -hmm. talk about everything. But it's the emotion. It's the interaction of those characters. Right. Tom with Val Kilmer and Tom with Miles Teller. Those scenes are precious. Yes. And, and so also with Jennifer Connelly. So that's what propelled the movie to be the huge success that's been around the world. What's really interesting is it's a pretty American movie. It's about our military, not yes. really, but they're the backdrop. Our foreign grosses outgross domestic grosses. So in other words, this movie captured audiences around the world yes. with a, a strong dollar. So when you look at the number, it would be 30% more because the dollar is so down everywhere else in, in the world without Russia and China. So a third of the world, this movie didn't, didn't, wasn't released. And, and the grosses are just almost a billion five. Let me talk it's to you about amazing. that Val Kilmer scene uh, as sure. well from Top Gun Maverick. Um, what were the sensitivities around getting that done and putting it in there because of his real life malady? Well, that was something that, that Tom and Val worked out with the director. It's something that Tom initiated, Val initiated. They worked, which is so great when you work with actors you have a script, and they get together and say, we're going to do it a different way. Mm -hmm. We're going to do this this way. And Chris McQuarrie, who is a writer and a producer on the show, would come in and rewrite things on the spot, and he's brilliant at doing that. So um, there was uh, a, a conversation that Tom did have with Val Kilmer to say, Absolutely. can you do it? Do you want to do it? I mean, was that in an original mm -hmm. script? I know I've asked you five I'm questions in a sure. row. I'm not sure it was in the original script, but mm -hmm. I know that they worked that out together. The, the, the four of them really worked it out. I mean, when that scene was over, I, you know, I, I looked at my wife yeah. and she looked at me like, whoa, that was real. Yeah. That was a real life moment right there. I've got Jerry Bruckheimer here on the Rich Eisen Show. Let, let, let me talk about Remember the Titans with you because sure. that is a beautiful sports movie. Right. It really is. And um, getting Denzel Washington involved and the sensitivities around that subject matter as well. And what, what was your reason for taking on that film for yourself, I, Jerry I, It's a story. It's about people that should be remembered. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's about it. That's about <laughs> stories about this this coach and this team, and that's why you wanted to take, exactly. on, take, take on with that. You remember the Titans is part of your, of your world, no question about that, as well as... Uh, Glory Road. We had uh, we had um, we had the the, the great uh, uh, actor who plays um, uh, Don Haskins, John Lucas here, telling me about how Don Haskins was uh, on the set for that sort of thing as well. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to make a movie about people that are alive mm -hmm. and tell their story, and that's the most difficult. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the Seattle Kraken. It's a fascinating uh, uh, development right here. The NHL. Actually, you know, here, here, I would like to play a tape for you. Sure. And then you, and you tell me about this acting. Because um, Jerry Bruckheimer is not only a guy who brought so many great movies 
uh, to uh, the silver screen, but also uh, CSI uh, to the smaller screen. And um, when we, Jerry, were going to the Super Bowl in Miami, um, our show open um, was a no-brainer for us that we played it over and over and over again where I got in the role of Horatio Kane, And I want you to see if this is... As Good. legit as it, here we go. This is it. This is uh, me in the role of Horatio Kane, if you will, channeling my inner Caruso as only I could for, for the Rich Eisen show. What do we have here, Frank? It's a messy one, Rich. Probably one of the worst we've ever seen. The Vince <laughs> Lombardi trophy was last seen on that yacht. Now it's gone missing. I want to find that trophy, Frank. Because when I play, I play to win. No Lombardi trophy, no ball game. What do you think, Jerry? Really well done. Thank you, sir. Really well done. Thank you. I'm giving myself a round really of applause well if you don't yeah, mind. As you no, we're just finishing another sports movie, which, what which is really interesting. It's called Young Woman in the Sea. It's for Disney+. Plus. Hopefully okay. we'll get it in theaters also. Okay. It's with, Trudy, it's with uh, Daisy Ridley. I've heard of her. Plays the star, the girl from Star Wars. Yes. And it's about the first woman that swam the English Channel in 1926. Her name is Trudy Eberly. Okay. The story is that back in, I think, 1919, yes. there was a ferry that went down in, in, in Long Island. 3,200 women and children drowned. Biggest disaster until 9-11. Yes. And the mother, German immigrant family, says, my girls are going to learn how to swim. The father says, no. It's uncouth. I don't want to be That's not going to happen. Hmm. She persists. She has her kids take swimming lessons. The one girl gets the measles and is partially deaf. Okay. Uh, and the water would really be a problem for yes. her. But she excels so much that she goes to the Olympics. She set a bunch of wood records, not at the Olympics, because they wouldn't let them train. They wouldn't let the women train. So she gets over there. And they won't feed them properly. They didn't let them train. And so she came in, I think, like third and won a, and a relay. So she was supposed to set all kinds of world records. It didn't happen. She came home. She was very depressed. She finds a coach to train her to do the English Channel. And he had tried it 21 times and failed. Yeah. She goes out to swim it. And about the seventh mile, he sees she's going to make it and decides that's not good for his career. So he poisons her tea. He puts something in her tea. Damn! True story. It's all true. And she doesn't finish. She gets sick and doesn't finish. She goes back and hires another tree. She's so determined. She hires another trainer. And not only does she swim the English Channel, she beats the men's record by two hours. Her huh. name is Trudy Everly. Nobody's ever heard of her. She had the biggest parade down Fifth Avenue for an athlete ever. When you see the black and white footage, you you won't believe it. I've never heard of this story. It's a fantastic, again, stories about people that should be remembered. Yes. Black Hawk Down, another movie. Those 18 men that died, yes. they'll always be remembered now. Huh. Gee, and that's going to be on Disney Plus? Disney Plus. Just like National Treasure Edge of History is coming to Disney Plus December 14th? That's right. Okay. Um, Fire Country on CBS that starts airing Fridays at 9 Eastern. New episodes airing Fridays at 9 Eastern on CBS. Okay, and then the newest and the newest Beverly Hills Cop movie in production now for Netflix. You see, I don't sleep. You don't, and you're going to win the Stanley Cup, right? You're going to bring a cup to Seattle. Well, that's that's another issue. We got to talk about that. <laughs> going to bring a cup? I mean, that's got to be eventually. Amazing. What a scene that is up there eventually. right now for the Seattle Kraken. It's crazy. Just beat the the Sabers five one last night. It was sold out. It's it's fantastic. Why'd it you really do is. that? Why'd you want to be part of that? Uh, I'm a builder. I like to create things and right. build things. That's what movies are. You start with an idea, you get yeah. a screenwriter, you, you make it happen. I love hockey, and I wanted to, to be a part of it. Yeah. So a friend of mine, Harry, Harry Sloan, who's a, fan, a financial wizard, mm -hmm. said, well, let's get a hockey team. So the Ducks were for sale. It didn't work out because Samuel owned the arena and the land around. It wasn't going to be a good deal. We, uh -huh. we couldn't outbid them. And somebody came to us for Pittsburgh. They were for sale. And then they drafted Crosby. And they said, we're not for sale anymore. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we... Makes sense. We decided Vegas would be a great place. Mm -hmm. So we go to Gary Bettman. We make a deal with Gary for Vegas. And then 08 hit when the markets crashed. And mm -hmm. so we couldn't get an arena built. 
Then Tim Lewicki, who's an amazing builder himself, he, he he's just one of those. Yeah, folks in L.A. certainly yeah, know him he, for the Kings know, for all those Kings years. And, yeah. and he was in Seattle. for Not in Seattle. He was oh, in, yeah, no, in for, Toronto. Oh, yeah, for the Seahawks as well. That's sure. right. Uh-huh. That's right. Uh-huh. And so he, he came to us. He said, I have an idea how to take the key arena, mm-hmm. keep the roof because it's historically protected, and then dig underneath and build a whole new arena. And we said, great. David Bonderman, who's the lead investor, a fantastic man, loves sports. He said, let's go do it. So he raised some money. We got the arena built. And Gary, very fortunately for us, gave us a franchise. We, we paid for it, but he gave us a franchise. And the people that David has brought in, the Lewicki brothers, Tim and Todd, Todd runs it. Mm-hmm. And he's what a great manager. What a, a man who embraced the community. The way he hires people, what a gentleman he is. And then he hired Ron Francis, who, as you know, is a yeah. great general manager. Sure. And w- what happened, you know, they expected us to be Vegas. We're going to be right out of the box. We're going to have a, a team that competes for the Stanley Cup. It didn't happen because the general managers got so smart. We, The NHL protected eight players plus a goalie for each team. Mm-hmm. Right? So the ninth player, if they had a really good ninth player, he got traded. So they got draft picks. So there wasn't a lot there as good as it was for Vegas. Right. And they were offered bad contracts. Ron didn't want to take bad contracts. So he put together a very good competitive team. Unfortunately, the goaltending didn't hold up as well as we wanted it to. So we got a great draft pick. Manny Beneers is fantastic. Well, I'm a Michigan Wolverine, yeah. so you, went, you, went, you, and, you chose and, wisely. And we got Wright. Now it was another fourth fourth pick, but he was really supposed to go to the first pick. So we're building the team through the draft, which is the way Colorado did it. You know, what, four or five years ago, they had 40-some points. I mean, we had 60. So I, they're doing it the right way. We just have to have our fans be be patient. Now, now, it's going to happen. And I know that this might be out of the bailiwick here, but do you think the success of this team in, in that arena might lead to an NBA team going there? We sure Jared? hope so. Would you be part of that? Would you want to be part uh, that, of that? If they allow me, who knows? Right. Right. Interesting. Because, I mean, I know Seattle fans are just nuts for that sort of idea. They're the greatest really... sports fans out there. They really are. And that's why I was so excited when Tim came to us about yeah. about Seattle. They're really, really terrific. And, and, bef- and they, love the, they love hockey. They love basketball. They're great football fans. Uh, they love all their sports. Well, and, and so, you know, before I let you go, I'm going to take one more run at this. I did mention this to you the first time we met a couple of years ago. I suggested you name your team this. You went Kraken, which is great. But, you know, you've got a mascot named Bowie, and I understand it's Seattle. And But that, that mascot should ne- be nicknamed Grunge, sir. The Seattle Seattle Grunge. Like, a, you're in Seattle. That looks like a grunge. I know it's a troll. I get it. I'm trying. Let let me help you produce is what I'm saying. I, if I may, look. If I may, look. Jerry, I, I wasn't part of this. This was for the kids, and they they got it. Did they showed a Understood. bunch of kids did different uh, mascots, and the kids picked this one. So okay, it's so, working. So it's I'm, all good. So I'm now telling kids no. Okay, that's what I. But that's what I do for a living uh, at home as the best dad ever. Jerry Bruckheimer, thank you for coming in. I would love to have you back anytime you want. We barely scratch the surface on the pop call. Yeah, there's, there's so much you. good stuff that, that we've been involved in and such a thrill to entertain audiences. And You've whether it's it. a movie that I make or a, a hockey game, it, it's so great when you see people come together, cheer, laugh, cry. Movies do that to you. Sports does that to you. It's great. No question about it. And again, Top Gun Maverick is amazing. Good luck to you in the award season. You deserve all the awards you want for that, sir. Fire Country uh, on CBS Fridays at 9 Eastern time. I look forward to that newest Beverly Hills Cop movie on Netflix. And then National Treasure, Edge of History. The series is coming to Disney Plus in December. My kids and I, will we will be locked in on that. Fire, C- Fire Country is the highest new rated show. Well, I mean, you, did, you know, you what, believe it? when was the last time a, a, a network said no to you? Uh, they'd say it all the time. What's their problem? <laughs> what the hell's the matter with this industry? For, check out again Fire Country on CBS Fridays at 9 Eastern Time. Uh, at Bruckheimer JB on Twitter. Thank you for coming in here, sir. Thanks really for having me. Anytime. My great. gosh, let's do this again. 